Let's hear another entertaining story from Don Lee. Uh, I was 
ready to sign the offer sheet because I don't. I did have a job three months after graduation. I thought any normal Indian would get a job. I did. I was applying. I was. If you would go back to some of the <coughs> articles I wrote, um, I uh, one ring of pan paper because Ateneo has only like one page in the resume, one page resume. That's the hand page, right? So I photocopied 100 page, 100 pieces of it, one entire 100 page. I sent it out. No calls. Right? Financial crisis. Eh? 1997. So I said, I like to read them, so okay. That time it was 12,000, that's commission and everything. And I went to the half day workshop, and they had to teach you, you can be a millionaire, but I'm not working on it. You can be a millionaire by selling encyclopedias, right? And you have to dream that you can own a house and everything. I said, wow, that's nice. Okay, I like it. But I was very lucky because I did, uh, that was the morning. In the afternoon, I was interviewed for another job. And, and that was actually Burger King. So that time, the one who interviewed me, it was uh, owned by uh, Pure Foods. It was owned by Ayala at that time. The one who interviewed me was the president of Burger King. And, and he said, um, um, well, you can always sell encyclopedia, but Burger King, I will give you a chance to, to really do marketing. You know, my, my, my background is marketing. And he said, you can do marketing, and I'll train you how to do it. Right? And I said, okay, fine. So, encyclopedia, burgers. Mas class ang encyclopedia. But I then said, okay, let's try Burger King. Only because I have an affinity. I want to, my, my dream that time was to have my own hotel, restaurant, and that. So I said, okay, let's try and learn um, uh, Burger King. So, the president said, I'll train you and I'll teach you everything I, I know. I said, good deal. Right? So, same offer, 12,000 pesos. Except that I don't have food. And the first, the first, uh, and my first job was actually when he said, "I'll teach you uh, uh, marketing." The first assignment he gave me was to go to Robinson's Galleria, the first Burger King store, right? And I was in charge of the grader, right? The grader. I what, what? I thought marketing. Or you give me the grader and every day, day in and day out. I would just get burgers and put it there and watch it to go into oblivion. And after a few. Seconds, you call them. Wow, you did school. Right? And that's every day. He said, Did I go to Ateneo for this? <laughs> just to cook burgers. Right? And, 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 after, and after, you know, two months, they, they, they assigned me to, to the kitchen, and basically I was handing the grader, and then the next stop was one of my learning was that when you go to the grader, it gets very easy. It's oil dripping, right? So, Basically, I'm not plugging Burger King, but Burger King has the healthiest burger because it's not fried. You don't do this, right? Go to the cleaner, all the fats drip, right? So and then the burger will fall. But the thing is, they don't tell you is that when you get the burger, you will wipe it with fat. <laughs> so I think it's very easy. That's why you know it's, it's all black and everything, but that's okay, right? And then and then one of the learning I had by most of you, you have to dirty your hands in the front line. So that you get a real perspective when you plan. Right? And I did appreciate that. I kept on asking them, why do you want people to go through the greater? Why is that so important? And, and he said, you have to understand fully the soul of the business, and then your mind can open to all possibilities. The greater was the soul of Burger King. If that breaks down, Burger King cannot be open. Right? There's no burgers there. So every burger goes through that. And that struck me was that what you have to understand you cannot just you don't you cannot be just superficial that you want to you know be advanced and feel that you're so learned and you want to do so many other things you have to go with the basics and the fundamentals and that is why for six months I I went into the kitchen training even up to now this is 98 I even memorized how many if those of your operations you would know 21 grams mayo 40 grams lentils. Uh, three, uh, four tomatoes, two pickles, nine grams ketchup, three grams mustard, all of that. It's in the degree of like, whopper is 155 degrees Fahrenheit. Co coffee is 185 degrees Fahrenheit. And we test that every time, every two hours. That was the discipline that was being taught to me. And even the kitchen setup was taught to me, right? In fact, I later realized that they were, they were, um, they were saving money when I was there. Why? Because in the burger station, we need to well, one to get the burger and one to put the vegetables. Because I'm so tall and my hands are very long, I can do it at the same time. So in my station, I thought so myself. 
if they put another person there, I get to bump in. And, and so this picks up, so I get a station of my own, right? But I did realize that after that, um, it, was, it, was, it was really good learning that whenever when I was recalled to the head office after six months, when I started to conceptualize company and to create burgers, I had a kitchen set up in my head. So then, and even I was, I was training the front counter, so even the POS system and all of that, because I was training operations, when I was drafting marketing campaigns, all of the entire system is in mind, so I know what is doable and what is not. So for example, I know that the fry station and the chicken station are the same, so you cannot have a fry, fryer there, and you want to do something fried with the sandwich, you have to run. So things like that, you have to put that, that time in motion there, so it, it would disrupt operations. Then I understood why operations and marketing do not like each other. Because when the marketing plans, it is with total disregard. You don't, you don't, you don't really understand. And that's, that's fine, right? You have other theories. But you can appreciate marketing more fully now if you have, you know, consider operations. Like for example, a market would always keep on pushing a lot of products. But the POS counter can only handle so many products there. Right? And you have, if, if you, you can have, if possible, you can have infinite products, but you have to have two or three places. That, Feels your, your service time. Because you have to serve a customer in two minutes. Right? So, so small things like that you begin to appreciate. And these are the small things of this. That I get to appreciate, but well, they don't have, um, now I, I get to have my own. I have other retail outlets of my own. I understand that already. So that was very good learning for me, right? To understand the soul of the business, right? To understand and to, uh, to get your hands dirty so you understand the entire process. So when you plan, it, it, uh, it, it is in full appreciation of everything. So, my second job, after three and a half years, I took up my MBA, and after that, my seatmate was actually the Senior Vice President for the Inquirer, Rene Reynoso. We were seatmates, uh, so the, the, the Murdoch MBA was actually designed every weekend, Friday and Saturday, Friday night and Saturday good morning, right? full, full day, so it's uh, 9 to 6. So, for a year and a half, we were doing an MBA, and my seatmate was the SVP of the Inquirer. And every time, we, you know, we were both early, and, and you know, we copied each other, I didn't copy and things like that, it became very close, right? So that time, after that, Burger King was sold to, uh, Fear Food was sold to San Miguel. So we were advised that you may not have a job anymore, right? They might be done later, they might not, but we don't know. So that time, because the seat mate was very close, the SVP of Burger King said, why don't you join me? And, and I said, okay, fine, and media is, is important, it's powerful, I'll join you in, in media. So I went to the Inquirer. I was very excited. Okay, what do, what can I do with this? Is 2005. What can I do with Inquirer? It's very, you know, very powerful platform. Inquirer was ever was going to work for sponsorships and everything, right? And and he said, okay, I'll give you your first training. And your first training is obituaries. <laughs> okay, so you have to handle obituaries. Oh, obituaries. I, I, okay, fine. If I'm at the NAO, I think further I didn't do that bad. So you need to give me an obituary assignment. But I said, no, you have to take on the obituaries. Right? And, and okay, so I said, fine. And I was thinking of putting the polar ads and everything, but you're going to leave the polar ads. That's a black and white. You cannot be happy, right? In an in a, in a obituary page. Right? So, there. This was good learning because okay, what he said was that, okay, you want the polar version, that's fine. But you have to understand first the black and white. Because again, going back to the basics, to the very principle, you have to understand first of all right, the soul. It's not all the sexy things that what you can do, right? But you have to understand the, the soul of journalism, why you do, why advertising is there, why you can't have too much advertising, and all the different other things. And with obituary, it was very hard. How do you, how do you sell obituary? Very hard to sell obituary. So my first thing was actually I had to go to visit Arlington. Oh, yeah, and funeral pass, these are my top two clients. Um, in fact, you don't, because you can sell to the consumer, right? So you go to the funeral part of yourself. So my first week on the job was, I was sitting there, and uh, I was actually waiting for people to come in crying, and then, oh, you want obituaries? <laughs> 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 right? So you have to do that. And, and that's fine. Um, I became very close to the owners, actually, for, for both, you know? Very close with, the owner, with both the owners now. Uh, we gained our market share that we became the preferred owner. You know, we, we became, uh, Space. Um, and we all, my, my boss was also said, you're, you're very good because right now people are dying to be in the inquirer. And, and I was like, uh, because we were able to establish a very strong relationship. I was the head of OBIT and I was really there learning. Imagine my first week I saw how they, you know, uh, how they embark 
person. And that was like, wow. <laughs> From Burger King to Empathy. <laughs> and and, and you, get to, you get to appreciate. And, and that's one of the learning. You have to be on ground. Right? Because we were able to get market share you know, when my boss taught me. Um, I was also active in, there's, there's what we call a uh, Philippine Mortuary Association. You know? The membership is all the uh, partners. And even in the Christmas party, they have a raffle. You know what's the raffle? Platinum. <laughs> so platinum comes. It's worth, you know, 600,000. It's expensive. They say because it's comfortable. It's very light. <laughs> Very light. So when the people are carrying it, they won't have a hard time because it's a hard time. So it is light. Okay? Unless you put a very fat guy. Right? Uh, but, but that's a grand prize. So I was like, whoa, right? It's the industry. But we gained a lot of ground. In fact, um, I ended my one year, one and a half year stint, just purely running movie bodies. Uh, we from 20%, we were like 50% market share. Like literally, people are tired. And, and after that, uh, we, we, we gained ground, so uh, they asked me to be launched the job market. I handled, you know, inquiring variable, that time for a bad return. All the products under the inquiry group, and of course, the main uh, inquirer, the flagship brand, I became the head of marketing. So from the division head, I was promoted after nine months to handle the job market and everything. And then after that, I was head of marketing. It was, it was a good position. Um, I have a big budget, there was coming to be sponsorships, whether ads or, or anything. It was, it was okay to settle. It was okay to settle, right? Uh, and, and another important, very powerful, right? I have ambassadors coming to me just wanting to get 15 minutes of my time because they, he had a golf tournament and he needed my, my help. It's nice, and I got, I got a lot of exposure. And and and, and to be fair to you, I, I I really appreciate they really taught me well. And it was because of that I was I became the youngest president of the Philippine Marketing Association. Right, I was 27 that time. I was president of the national president, like Philippines. Um, only because when uh, 15 of us were running for the presidency, the 15 board of directors, someone nominated me first, and no one dared to post. It was just the president wife. Right, said, oh, sponsorship did huh? <laughs> so I was supported. Uh, so I was, I was lucky. Right? But then, uh, I was willing to settle there already, and then Marik Sigueto was my Dina in my sponsor my wedding too. I was ready to settle, but one thing happened. So this was my, my uh, telephone. It rang one day. I was VP of marketing of the Inquirer. The phone rang and said, out of the group, is this the head of marketing of the, uh, the Inquirer? So I said, um, yes. <laughs> and he said, do you want to be a CEO? CEO, huh? Oh, I said, I was looking at it, my boss is just 15 years older. It has to, it has to take him a lot of time before he hits the orbit. So, it's, I, cannot, I cannot move up. I cannot move up anymore. So, I said, yeah, if I'm going to go aggressive on my career, I want to get, I want to uh, maybe explore something, right? That's really my own person. I can go to the inquiry, I have my team already there, they're just running the show. So, he said, do you want to be a CEO? And I said, okay, tell me more. And he said, okay, I have an interview with the board of directors of this company I cannot disclose. Right? And, and, and so I, was, I, was, uh, I went to work, um, Shangri-La Ortigas, a 15-month board. I, I sat there, and I didn't know what the company is. And they started asking me questions. What do you do in all of these things? And then that's when I realized that the company, right, is actually an internet company. I don't show the company name, but the internet company. And I, I'm not a techie person. I'm not an internet person, right? So the, when the board asked me, what's your internet experience? I said, uh, Yahoo <laughs> and uh, Friendster. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't surf a lot, so I was telling them. And said, what would, and they were asking a lot of technical questions. What would you do if our, uh, if our site went down? Would you recommend a server that is based in the US or do you want to develop a cloud money? So, based in the US or do you want to base here? And I said, uh, I'll have to ask my ID. Right? So I don't know the answers. Right? And eventually I realized, uh, because for me, again, I was, you know, I'm more of a gamer in the internet. I'm not a business digital person. So if you look at the rank, the overall rank there, I'm rank 51 in the world in Dark Throne. So I'm the highest rank Filipino, you know, and I use Kao Kao. You're in three kingdoms, you know, Kao Kao is. But I'm rank 51 in the world. So I, I really play more games. Internet for me is fun. It's not a business, right? But eventually, 
uh, I realized it was uh, to revive Yehi. Yehi was a spook of Yahoo. It was uh, created by, uh, in 97 by five university students who spoof Yahoo. It went, it went almost bankrupt and then uh, Kasha, it's a Singaporean company, bought it. But during the bubble burst, Kasha had to sell it again. It's now owned by Vantage Group under the field equity, uh, well securities under the group of Wilson C. So the, my mandate was revive it you know, and turn it around and get it listed in the stock market because all my bosses are stock brokers. Right, so get it listed, like all tech internet companies get it listed in the stock market. So that's, that's how they look like. So what I did was when I went in, I don't know what to do. Uh, how do you, no experience. I was open, job market, right? And, and inquirer print, and then you go here, right? But when I accepted, I, I only told myself one thing. That time I was 28, and I said, um, to be a CEO of a company, of an internet company, I know that the future is digital. If I fail, I would, I'll just catch up if I fail, right? So, so I said, I still have some leeway. So then I, I went in and for two years, Yehe.com was in worse shape than before I joined. I don't know what to do. Right? Um, but eventually, you know, it was hard. Any, any website, when you go up, it's like media, you sell advertising, right? That's ad space. When I go to all my friends, I was PMA president, Philippine Marketing Association president. When I was going to my friends, can you please uh, book, an, uh, book an ad in my, on my website? Right? And they would, they would say, uh, no. I said, okay, free na lang. Nobody. <laughs> they don't want to be, to be there. I said, look at your friends. And, and, and I began to realize that the reason why marketing people do not place ads on their website, on, on our own, any website for that matter, is that most of the websites, are handled by the IT department. It's not handled by, by, by the marketing group. And then I began to realize, okay, so that, that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that was a paradigm shift for me. So now I go to them, I don't sell them ads anymore. I, I, uh, I tell them, can I, the, the marketing, the website is a marketing platform. Can I, and you should have it. If you don't know how to run it, I'll run it for you. Right, because now your website is not just purely text, but something engaging, something interactive, right? So uh, this was a new look of EA. That's our flagship, right? And and basically we changed EA uh, uh, to uh, from being a portal to now a full service agency. But that time we were having a hard time creating, you know, selling digital because a lot of the brand managers, CEOs don't understand internet marketing. So what I did was I I, I called up a lot of my friends. No? Basically uh, when I when I went to when I went to, like, my first client was Chowki, the Jollibee Group, and all the others. When I went to them, I said, I'll handle your, uh, handle your website. And after that, once I created their website, then they're the ones who now come to me and say, uh, can I put an ad on your, on the .com? Because now, they understand that they have to drive traffic to their website. I'm not selling ads anymore, but I was now selling website development. So it started, that, that, that started, no? But after that, they asked me afterwards, can I also, do you know the, do you know I7? Do you know Kickstar? Do you know Yahoo? Right? Because we would also like to place ads in there. But then, I said, wait a minute, why would I give you the phone numbers of all my competitors? Right? So, so that I was struggling. But then I realized, they would find a way to, all of these brands, they so would find a way to get access Right, to all of these other website publishers. So being a divisoria grown Chinese, I said, okay, let me I'll call all my competitors. I called all of them and said, I have a client, okay, I will refer them to you, but to give me commission. Right? So even if you regard it, whatever commission, they give me commission. And that started the ball rolling. Um EA actually at the end of twenty two oh nine was is the biggest media reseller of Yahoo, of Inquirer, of all the other websites. Our lowest, the inventory I can say is here that low. But I was saying a lot of others. Now, as, as, as we grew, the industry wasn't growing, right? It's very hard. So what I did was, I called, again, called my competitor. I said, I have a, I have a question, can we meet? And, and then, that's when they said, okay, where do you want to meet? I said, let's meet in AIM. What they didn't know was that I gathered all of them in, 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 a, in a small room, and so when they were there, I said, what's happening? All of us are here. 
right? And I said, you know, we have to, our competitors are not each other. We are, we're underpricing each other, but our competitors are actually TV, radio, and film. We're not getting that, that budget, right? We're killing each other. We have to, that's why we have to work together to evangelize the industry. So that is when IMAP was created. It's the gathering of all the digital marketing professionals um, in, in, the, in the Philippines. Right? And we're the first in Asia to do that, to really consolidate all the players. At that time, there were so many fly-by-night companies. Right? So once you are part of IMAP, then it legitimizes you. And we're aligned with the ad board, we're not very aggressive with, um, with, with the advertising and the marketing profession. Right? And I was the founding president. You know? Um, so we create the Code of Ethics. We have interactive summits every year. We created the awards. So we recognize the best uh, digital marketing work. Right? And right now it's only, I think, 10 years already. So, so yeah, hey, today, uh, it got listed. I left 2010. It got listed in 2011. So I wasn't able to fulfill. No, uh, that time I was already offered another job. Uh, but yeah, hey, is now a yeah, like I said, content creation, it does digital media planning by Facebook, brand building, website design and development, mobile app, social media. So it has become a digital agency on its own. So the next way was actually for me, actually I ran here for five years. Uh, our growth was like 100% um, um, every year. So it was okay, it's digital, it's always like that. No? But my next job was actually to run Makan. No? So, yeah, hey, as a digital agency, we were actually servicing a lot of ad agencies who do not know digital. Mahan was my biggest client. And then they said, can, can we just get you? Rather than working uh, from a commercial arrangement. And that time, uh, I saw an opportunity because I, when you look at my, my training, Burger King Choir, it's all local training, like Burger King's Ayala. So I was searching for a, a multinational assignment that I got. So I said, okay, let's, let's jump, right? So I went to Mahan. And there, uh, I handled, I was the chief innovation officer for Mahan, and I headed MRI, which is a digital agency, right? And one of the things I learned was, again, uh, going back to Black, you can see the Black illustration going away. We were doing our planning, and I can't forget, um, our head of our global uh, gave us brainstorming ideas. Now, that, that's brainstorm. So he, he gave us an illustration board, and he said, okay, put down your ideas here, right? But the thing is, do not write with the white side. Find a way to show me your idea about the black side. Because if we're not there to, to just to just share what we what we think or what we have, but our challenge is is, 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 is to find a way right, to, to really go outside the box, like how digital is. So that's why we have to be great. How do we present not on the white side? Right? Where everyone was writing there, but from our end we have to write on the black. That's why we can't write on the black on the black side, you'll find either post it or whatever. But that was the essence of it. That we have, in order to disrupt, we have to find and, and work on the black side of the illustration board, not on the white side. Right? The white side is easy. Everyone can just put things there. But if you are given, if you are forced to use the black side, you are now forced to be creative. And with that, I, I because of that, I had the way. I was actually going to, I was actually going to a lot of my uh, clients. I was pitching for clients that time. We were trying, uh, can I do your website or digital marketing campaign? And a lot of clients, yeah, they're, they're okay. But um, there's MRM or Mahan has nothing to help me sell. We were just a normal website design agency. So what I did was actually, because of that, because of the black, you know, black side challenge, I created what I call in the industry called the digital brand health. It's actually a system where when you give me your brand and your competitors, I would be able to assess the health of your brand for the digital space. So from, again, from Coke and all of that time. So I developed that on my own. So I created an algorithm and, and all of that. Um, and, and, and whether it's faulty or not, my first version of digital brand health was, uh, was I, I didn't like it. But it's, it's the idea, the concept itself, we were able to sell. So when I was going to Coca-Cola, to Unilever, I said, I, when I go in, I tell them, I don't tell them, I, have a, I am a good website developer. I tell them, did you know that your brand health for your shampoo is at 20%? It's very bad. And then they said, oh, how can we make it work? And then I teach them, then they can. Right? So it's like, you know, you don't have a sickness, you go to the doctor, doctor says you're sick. Right? And then you okay, right? So basically something like that, right? So, so now, all the brands were coming to me, I want a brand health check, okay. I said, what's the formula? <laughs> and, and 
Eventually, this this actually report, and even in Asia, I was I was already having a data group who was doing brand health checks for all the countries, right? And we were building them. So our growth was uh, from from like a 10 million company in two years. It was like, of course, not, uh, not as big as most of you here, but from 10 million to like 250 million in two years. Not bad, then, you know, five people to around 70. And. Uh, and these are the some of the brands I handled, but we were digital agency for for Coke. We did the Coco FW campaign. We did Nestle, Nescafe points, everything, and it was fun. Right? So I was able to manage all of these brands, and and, and I also advise a lot of my counterparts in uh, in in Macan around around Asia. Right? So I was lucky. So we got agency player only because I had a head start. Remember, Yeni? I was a pseudo agency already. Right? So I didn't unfair advantage. But, but of course, uh, um, we were one to think, meaning in the entire Makan around the world, we had the highest growth rate. Right? That's what I want to the highest award they, they gave out. And you know, again, it was lucky. Low base, and the digital was growing very, uh, very fast, and I was winning the, the blue chip clients, the, the Coke and, and BPI and others. You know, were agency player, and of course, Southeast Asia agency player. Okay. And because of all of that, I begin to realize that every time I have to, I have to sell ideas and everything, I have to speak in front of people. If you were to ask all my teachers in high school and college, you will never see me in front of people because I have stage fright. I, I have massive stage fright. I remember when I was TMA president, so I have to address the group every month. They always, they were always, and they would know that my nanny would also be a baby. Welcome. Members, <laughs> like that. Like, right? So, so I realized that I have to sell myself because I'm in the field of marketing. But I just have to ditch that stage fright. So what I did was I just started talking and talking. So I started tools first. So when you tell something, it just yes, right? But eventually, now with industry groups, and you, you begin to get that confidence level. Right now, you just don't think you don't even care. <laughs> but I'm gonna not, right? But but I always tell people, you know, when you when you start talking, I, I average around three to five talks a month on top of my classes and everything. And I always tell them that, that it, it, the reason why I give a talk is, is always because I, you need to learn everything when you're preparing your slides, when you're doing everything. You know? And at the same time, uh, I, it helps me to manage my stage fright. So thank you for being there and adapting. Uh, but, if, for example, one or two months I didn't get on stage, the next time I'm going up, I, I get scared. Right? So it's like, okay. right. so and that, that's how, how I over that. And then, and then, one thing I always have, that's why I shake. So sometimes you see black, I don't think anything If you're too scared, sometimes you just don't see anything. Right? And, and my, one of my mentors will say, that's okay. It's okay to be scared when you talk. Because that, that then, you really be prepared. You don't take it lightly, right? Every presentation, you, 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 you do your slides, right? And you are so prepared that when you're there, you, you don't give it a chance, right? And that's why it's okay to be scared, right? And that's why this crowd, I'm scared. Because you're not my normal crowd. In digital market, I can win it. You, I don't, I don't. <laughs> So, and, and because of that, no, uh, and I like this Socratic quote, no, as for me, all I know is that I know nothing. And then because of that, um, I, what I always feel as a benchmark, I started teaching, in, I now I'm teaching four schools in La Salle. I teach MBA in La Salle. Uh, San Ben, I teach uh, doctorate. UAMP, I teach undergrad. Right? And Bradford, I teach MBA also. Um, so these are my night jobs, Saturday jobs. And I always tell my students, all of you here, I tell my students, teaching for me has the lowest ROI. Has the lowest ROI. But the only reason I'm here is because I get to learn from you. The moment that you challenge me and you are correct, you don't have to come to class anymore. I'll give you the four. Okay. So in my class, if you look at even my UAP students, they're so hyperactive because when, and that's why I begin to realize they're more digital than myself. Right? They're more digital than myself. So they're the ones after you know training me when they're saying, "No, sir, uh, outdated. Yeah, that's, that's outdated. You don't do that anymore." 
right? So I was able to get a field. No? So, for example, my and then I and purposely I teach doctoral, MBA, and, and undergrad. So undergrad we see they're very hyper. We have a Facebook group, right? And they're very active. So I would post an article that I read and said, okay, why is Facebook? You, if you're a brand and you post on Facebook, your the people who like do not see you anymore, right? Organic reach is, is dead, right? And they discussed it there, right? Now all my MBA class they would so so they would they would. Uh, talk to each other, but because the MBA is not marketing, you know, so I teach internet marketing. Uh, some are finance, some are, so it's a good balance, right? But for the doctorate for San Beda, my students are like 50 and above, right? So imagine you go to class, like, see that they were now saying, good morning, so. <laughs> and then, okay, so then I would say, oh, how many of you check your assignments on, because I, for every of my class, I have a Facebook uh, secret group. When I go to my San Beda class, Doctorate. I say, okay, how many of you check your assignments? Did you post your assignments there already? And all of the doctorate discuss their head. I forgot my password. Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you forget your password in Facebook? But, but that's, you know, that's, that's, that's how it is. And you get a perspective, right? Because in, in the world of marketing, that, in, those insights matter. In fact, um, and because of that, um, a month ago, I came uh, for, my, for my daughter. They, they asked me to give a talk to parents. You know what the topic they asked for? What, these are for parents of uh, elementary and teenagers and uh, high school students. What your kids don't tell you about Facebook and the internet? Right? Do you know what they know? Right? And there I talked about, you know, what are the secret things? Why Facebook is passe to teenagers? What are the apps they use? Why is Tinder, uh, why is Tinder, why is Tinder uh, becoming a fad now? And why should parents worry if their son has a grinder app on their mobile phone? Right? So then things like that, right? And we look at Snapchat, we analyze how to and that's why I always tell them, if you're if you're if your daughter is like 10, 11, 12, go online with them. Right? Then we log on with them and teach them and then you know their password. So you can find it. Right? You play the password, have them do their password, you know. Right? And it's not, you're not there to be, you're, you're there to be big driver, but you're, you don't interfere. But at least you know where they're going, and things like that. That's a different topic again. Okay. okay, so again, I got all these things in my classroom, so migrating from the chalkboard to, uh, to now, no, 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 whiteboard, but these are my class in the sun. And of course, um, in, in my UAP class, the, my UAP undergrad class is the toughest, because the top 10% presents to my boss, Gabi Lopez. Right? You present to my boss, Gabi Lopez, and if he says yes, we sign a contract with you. Right? So here, you're representing their app idea, so I think we sign up too. This next week, I'm doing something. Uh, present your story idea. You present it to my CEO, Charo Santos. If Charo agrees to your story, we'll sign a contract. That's as easy as it is. So I bring them to real life. Right? And of course, the happiest moment is for me to, to see you know, all of them graduating. These are all my mentees that I train one by one, all of them. And after that, you know, that the good thing about, about it is you get to eat out afterwards. <laughs> okay, next. Okay, so these are like 10% of what I have. Okay, I'm, not, I'm not really just wanting, I just want to emphasize, this is just 10% of what I have. If you, I, since I gave so many talks, I have like 500 blocks <laughs> at home. But what is most important for me was really the validation from students. Right? And that cannot compare to whatever awards you receive when your student says that you, you know, um, you taught them well. And and I saw some of them now heading into agencies or doing a lot of, you know, brand managers. Right? They call themselves my anak, right? Or my my, my kids. No? And it's not as if we're, uh, we're more than ten years each other. That's how they treat me. And that's that's I think the most rewarding is you see all of them now very successful in their different fields. And like I always tell people, you know, because of all of these things that are done for the digital people, you know, Bruce Lee, they call me digital guru, but yeah, when I was telling them, I'm not digital, I only have 10 tweets in my life, right? And, and I don't even post on Instagram, right? And yet I post and I tweet everything for the celebrities and brands and all of that, right? But again, as you can see, I'm very, I'm a very private anti-social person, right? So, so, so I don't have to think. Even like, for example, our chief strategy of, of APS, and you're the chief digital officer of APS. You should be tweeting. You should be a thought leader about that. 
right? But you, you, you can dictate some things in life, right? And if you're like, for me, it's a personality, right? I don't, I don't want, uh, so I, I don't post on Facebook, right? So people can stop me, right? But in terms of the digital, digital space, I post a lot for most of the brands, almost every day, right? But for myself, yeah, that's, that's what you get. That's, that's the most. And, Okay, and then and finally, um, you know, I always tell people that a lot of people live in the world of luck. Earlier we talked about CSR, right? And we need to bring them to the light. And that was how I was trained also across all my different, uh, my, my journeys. That people always tell me, um, um, I'm part of Operation Smile, I'm part of various advocacy groups. Uh, I'm with the Junior Chamber. So whenever we go to Smoky Mountain, whenever we do advocacy work, that was what I learned. That you cannot help people. Right? You cannot tell people if you're not there. Right? So you really have to go deep dive. You can, you know, when, when, because with the Manila Junior Chamber, we go to Smoky Mountain, we adopted a place there. You will begin to realize that so, so small kids, they run very fast. And when they talk to you, they're so mature. So where do you get all of that energy? And, and you're so mature. And your kids, right? are you six years old? They said, no, I'm 13. And they're so small. Right? And then, then you begin to understand. Right? You begin to understand why, why, why things like that happen. And you begin to understand also why for your parents work, what is good to them, and how many other things. Right? And, and, and you, have, you cannot, for me, and that's why I like Dr. Kalina and all of those others now, you really have to do it yourself. Because it's different when you're sitting in the board and you help and you give money. That's different. That's nice. And you can do that always, right? But it's different when you're there. Then you have a different perspective. And you can to also do change, right? You can find ways to, to really help. Right, not just giving, giving money. So, uh, if you look at uh, uh, Angel, the, the guidance center, so for example, I sit in the board of operations. Smile. Every year we operate with children with left limbs. 1,000 uh, uh, babies with left limbs. Angel, if you go to YouTube, you will see her in our commercial. But look at how she looks afterwards, after the operation. It's 45 minutes to change her life from, from, from being, you know, uh, if a person with left limb, they don't. They don't come out into society because they will be ridiculed. 45 minutes, you change your life. Right? With just a simple operation. Right? And anyone of you can operate. It's not too hard. <laughs> That's not at all. I'm not a doctor. But uh, I, you, you should be see that. Uh, we observe the doctors. Um, and, and you will see turning points if you're very active here. Because you will see how a mother would give their baby to you. Right? Would give their baby. They're trying to say, count of a hala, you take care of me, and you will bring them to the doctor, they will then pack with you with a spine and say thank you ten thousand times. Right? And then you begin to realize that you know you, you, you have to do things like this also. No? Uh, sorry. Ah, um, at the same time, of course, like I said, no, uh, this I don't like talking about. Sometimes I do, sometimes I, I don't, but uh, you familiar with her? Uh, Kay Davantes, right? Justice for Kay. So she's my number one student in the sun. She's She got a four from me. And then I hired uh, her. I said, you're so good. Come. Join me. So she went to my Right? And that time, uh, the night before uh, she was uh, uh, the afternoon, I signed her thesis because we were supposed to work on her thesis for the sun. Right? And I didn't know that, okay, and then, then Saturday, next morning, we were supposed to meet. Right? I signed, tomorrow let's meet. What I didn't know was that that was the last time I would see her. But that night, she didn't make it because she was home. But then she was dragged to another place. Okay. And that time, of course, that was, again, that was, um, it was, it was really tough. And that time, I wasn't with Mahan anymore, I was with ABS. So I only went to Mahan to see her, to sign, say, okay, good to see you after four months. Okay, let's finish your business. Right. And, and, and that's why, um, um, you know, up and down in life. Right? But then I begin to see also how much of my former team members, which I was with ABS already, really, uh, were, were so part of it. Every time they go, uh, they, uh, because we, in, in the ad agency, we would, we would uh, stay up to around 11, 12 at night. That was normal for us. So every time one of them would go home, by 11 p.m., I would see all of them posting big numbers of their taxis. Because they were just so scared and so far away, right? So the, and therefore, being an ABS now, um, I, I created a project, you know, and I, I launched an app called Pasadero App. The app is, uh, if you download the app, it's a, it's a nice app. 
It's like, what you do is that whenever you're writing a cap or FX or whatever, you put in first your emergency contact, right? So you put in the name of your spouse, girlfriend, boyfriend, parents, whatever. So you put in the cell phone number. And what happened? Go ahead. And then when you're riding already in a taxi, you can actually take a picture of the plate number and the driver and store on your phone, right? So, so that's, that, that, that's it. Afterward, it's like, once, it, once you start your trip, then you just travel following Google Maps. Once you edit, then it's okay. But if, for example, uh, you, you, you sense something is wrong or something will happen, what you do is that use your thumb, you press on the red button. See the red button? You press it for two seconds. Once you press it for two seconds, it will become a, I don't know, you, you have to okay the microphone. It will become a black box. It will listen to everything that's happening. And the video will be turned on. So it will see what's happening. It might be confusing, but the video will turn on. And the contacts that you've identified, they will be sent a text immediately. Now, I'm, I'm using a Pasadero app. I'm in an emergency, and I'm in this location. Right? So that was what I you know, contribute to her and my other team. I actually gave this, well, of course, anyone can download this, but it was really for them. Right? That when you're, when you're, when you're uh, going home, don't, don't, be, don't be scared. Just use this. And you're on TV anyway, so at least uh, it's something, it's, it's more psychological than anything, right? So how they, they're using it. Okay. Then, of course, the place mentioned, people were just happy with it, then we got a lot of awards, but then that's beside the point. Okay. So why black? <laughs> Just to summarize. Uh, because in the end for me, black reminds me of the unknown. But the unknown does it not mean I should be fearful. But instead, <coughs> to just push ahead the chance of dark void that our minds go there. But in many cases, if you look at <coughs> um, life, right? sometimes you get scared of things. If you look at my career, it, there's, there's no consistency. I move from print to brand to agency to all of that. Um, but yet, if you look at uh, what I have learned in the process and my interactions with people, you begin to realize that in a lot of, if I were to be fearful, I wouldn't have done so many things. I would have said that, even in my first job, it wasn't bad, it was okay. I wouldn't have pushed for going after my, my MBA or, or even my doctorate or I don't even have to set up an organization, right? But, but and those are tiring. You know, from Quezon City every day to run to our CPC. <coughs> and, and I drive, so I don't, I don't have a driver. Uh, the last driver, the last driver I got, I was very impatient. So I had him sit in the back and I drove. I drove. I said, okay, park one right? That didn't work out, right? So my, my wife got mad. Uh, that I was letting the driver sit at the back. So, so then we realize, you know, uh, life is all about creating the, all of these meaningful moments. You don't have to be scared, you know? and, and it's all about you know, carving the busy the day, making the most out of it. It's okay to be busy, mean, sometimes crazy busy, but that, 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 that's okay, right? I always tell my, and I have a call with Bullet. I always tell my students, most of you are 25 or less. I always tell people, um, uh, when you start, when you start, don't find a job, right? Find a boss. That will help you. I would love to have all of those bosses. Uh, 21 to 30, don't even look at income. Don't, those that, they, they don't matter. Go after the learning, the promotion, all of that, the exposure. Right? And by 30, everything will just fall into place. Then your, your from financial capacity to all many other things, they will just exponentially increase. Right? But you have to be patient. Like this is a marathon. It's, you can't just be in, in a, at, at, um, at a very early stage. Because then we get also burned out, right? So we have to have a balance of, of everything also, right? Um, so that, of course, well, just remember all things came from that. Uh, but uh, I hope you would like to present 50 slides when you get 50 shades of that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I, I think, uh, thank you for your time. <laughs>